welcome. This will continue our apologetics class. We are still in Unit 3. Uh, the recording for this particular lecture while at the school, uh, for whatever reason, didn't quite uh, work. The computer messed up, and so I am forced to re-record this class through a different means. What, we're, what you should expect are the slides that I used to teach with, of course, with my voice underneath. So I'm going to go ahead and continue this class, and I do want to say that this particular lecture is probably the most important one of this entire unit. We're talking about the beginning of the universe. In previous days and previous weeks, we've been talking about how if the universe has a beginning, it leads us to the conclusion that the universe had to have had an adequate cause. And it's stated as such, the cosmological argument. Everything that has a beginning has an adequate cause. The universe had a beginning. Therefore, the universe had an adequate cause. We talked about how this was well understood and uh, some of the premises were agreed upon. However, many scientists who uh, were atheists, many materialistic scientists, they simply believed that premise number two was incorrect, that the universe didn't have a beginning. They believed the universe was eternal, and this is how they, this was the basis for all of their materialistic beliefs. And so now, in this, in this lecture, we're going to uh, show how uh, throughout the last hundred years, different evidences have come along to prove that the universe is not eternal. It ac actually proves that the universe had a beginning. Now, it comes down, most importantly, to two men who contributed to the discovery that the universe had a beginning. Edwin Hubble, who's on the right, and Albert Einstein on the left. We need to talk about what these two men did, what they discovered, and the conclusions that come from those discoveries. Let's start with Hubble. In 1919, he was offered a staff position at the Carnegie Institution for Science's Mount Wilson Observatory. It's near Pasadena, California. Maybe you've been there. It's a really cool location. And uh, when Hubble arrived, he, his arrival roughly coincided with the completion of a 100-inch Hooker telescope. That's what it was called, the Hooker telescope. And it was, at the time, the world's largest telescope. In, uh, and he spent his days looking up at the stars. And so what Hubble did was he actually pioneered many methods for measuring distances between galaxies. He's actually the first scientist to prove that there are other galaxies in our universe. It would have been suspected by scientists for many, for many years, but he's the one who first proved it. What he wound up doing is he looked out at distant pinpricks of light, which we had previously thought were stars, and he measured the distance through uh, different techniques that had been pioneered by him and others. And he realized that some of these, quote, stars were, were too far away to be in our galaxy. And it turns out that some of these stars weren't stars at all, but clusters of stars, millions of stars. They were galaxies that we were looking at, but they were so far away that they looked like one pinprick of light. Now, of course, these findings uh, were very important, but he also discovered a few things that are very important to the idea that the universe is uh, not eternal. And the term that you should remember is the term red shifting, red shifting. So we need to think of the spectrum of light like we almost think of sound. So in sound, there are different rate, there are different waves. There's radio waves. There are uh, higher pitches and lower pitches, and uh, all of that has to do with the frequency, or I should say, the speed at which the vibrations are moving. So the slower the speed, 
would be the lower the pitch, the higher the speed, the higher the pitch. And it's the same with light, only instead of uh, being a higher pitch or a lower pitch, the speed of the vibrations determines the color that appears to our eyes. So there are certain lights that we cannot see because the frequency, we just aren't susceptible to it with our own eyeballs. And then there are some colors that we do see. And of course, we think of light being uh, made up of the full spectrum of colors, the Roy G. Biv, or red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Well, what we've discovered, or what Hubble helped, uh, he wasn't the first to discover it, but he was the first to really utilize it in measuring distances. But what was discovered was that when light is traveling away from us, a source of light is traveling further away from us, the, a point of view, it will appear red on the spectrum. And if a source of light is moving toward you, toward a point of view, then it will appear blue. And so what Hubble did was he actually looked out at all of these galaxies and all of these suns and st uh, these stars in our, in our universe, and he noticed that every single one of them was red shifted. All of these galaxies that are outside of our own galaxy, they were all moving away from us, every single one, which was a fascinating discovery. He also discovered that the galaxies which are further away are moving faster away from us. He even came up with a way to plot it and a way to mathematically write it down. Basically, roughly speaking, uh, the farther away a star is from us, the faster it's moving away from us. And what happens is when you take this concept and you, uh, you visualize it as an entire universe, what you realize is that the universe is expanding. The way I visualize this in class, and sadly you won't get to see it, uh, but just imagine a black balloon with white dots on it. And those tiny white dots each represent a galaxy in space. What happens when you blow up the balloon? Well, each of those white dots, each of those galaxies, gets further away from each other. And the, one, the, the, the dots that are further away from other dots actually move away from each other faster. So this is how we can visualize the universe. The fact that we see all of these galaxies moving away from us proves to us that the universe is expanding. This is a very important discovery. The universe is expanding. Now, what does that imply? What implies that, well, think of it this way. If we're moving forward in time and the universe is getting bigger, then by the same logic, we could move backward in time to a point in which the universe and, and, and the further back we go, the more the universe will shrink. In other words, there is a finite point in the past in which the universe was uh, nothing, or at least started. You can't go back an infinite amount. There is a stopping point. And so Hubble was very instrumental in realizing that the universe has a beginning because the universe is expanding. Most uh, understandings by, by materialists were that the universe is static. It's, it's yes, the moons and, the, and, and planets orbit, but each galaxy is set in place and uh, equally distant from one another, and thus they could believe that the universe was eternal. But as soon as you realize that the universe is expanding, you have to come to the conclusion that the universe had a finite beginning. So that was Hubble's contribution. Then we get to Albert Einstein. Of course, very famous scientist, rightfully so. He formulated what's called the theory of general relativity. And we watched a video in class. That video should be posted on our Google Classroom if you would like to watch it. Uh, explaining what general relativity is. But uh, perhaps the best way to explain it is to uh, ask if you've seen the movie Interstellar. The film Interstellar visualizes time dilation, which is a product of general, general relativity. Uh, it visualizes that better than really anything I've seen. 
So in that movie, uh, there are astronauts who are traveling near black holes. And the idea is that the gravity that is formed by the mass of a, gra of a black hole actually bends space-time. And so the closer to the black hole you get, the, the slower time runs for you. Albert Einstein realized this by doing a thought experiment. He imagined himself on a train that was moving at the speed of light. And he imagined himself looking back at a clock tower. And he said, he, he basically surmised that if he was moving fast enough away from the clock tower, then the visual representation of time, which was coming from the ticking hands, would appear to move more slowly the faster he got, the closer to the speed of light he got. Think of it this way. Light, think of light as almost a, think of it as a physical entity, a physical matter. Light has to travel. When you turn on a light in a dark room, that light doesn't instantly reach your eyeball, eyeballs, even though it seems like it does. That light has to travel across the room for you to be able to perceive it. Of course, it travels so fast that we can't tell. It just seems like it just pops into existence to us. But light is traveling, and of course, that's where we, uh, we know how fast it goes. It goes at the, quote, speed of light. So what Einstein realized is that if you were traveling at the speed of light away from a source of light, then it would take some time to catch up to you. So if you're looking back at a clock, the hands on the clock, while they are moving, for someone who happens to be standing right next to the clock, they might be standing still for someone who's moving fastly away from it. And so this was the first uh, time he realized that time and space are relative and they are connected to one another. And what he did was he formulated something called space-time. He connected space and time. And this led to a completely different view on gravity than what Newton had surmised. Of course, Newton's work was instrumental in leading us this far, but Einstein realized that the reason that objects are attracted to one another is because they are bending space-time. So if you have a sun, which is a very massive object, it bends space-time more than something that is small. And uh, think of it like a, a bowling ball on a trampoline. You set it in the center of a trampoline. Anything else on the trampoline that's smaller than a bowling ball or lighter, or less mass than a bowling ball, will, will move toward that rolling ball. And that is how he visualizes gravity. Uh, think of the surface of the trampoline as space-time itself. Objects of mass bend space-time. And this was his... This is how he conceptualized gravity. Now, it's been later, it was further proven. Uh, for example, we, we've actually been able to observe light bending around massive objects like the sun or the moon. And so we know that this conception of gravity is accurate, or at least as best as we can understand. So what does this mean? What does all of this lead to? Well, he realized that Newton's view of gravity doesn't quite work exactly. So Newton believed that everything was static in the universe, that gravity was almost like magnetic forces. I guess that's the best way to explain it. That everything was attracting one another, but that everything was attracting one another uh, equally enough that everything becomes static. So think of these dots, these white dots as galaxies. Yes, they're attracting one another, but they're also being attracted by other galaxies, and thus they stay in place. So this was the idea of Newton. Newton believed that God had set up the universe in such a way that uh, it was static, and that gravity was keeping everything in place. But what Einstein realized is that if his view of gravity was correct, then Newton's view of a static universe could no longer be correct. In, in other words, everything would eventually congeal into one spot. And since things have not yet congealed, this means that the universe is not eternal. Think about that. If everything were, is going to eventually 
be congealed together. If everything's eventually going to contract into one spot, either, uh, then, then, then it's impossible for the universe to be eternal because it hasn't happened yet. We've talked about this in previous classes, but let me repeat it again. Think of a car driving for eternity. If the car has a finite amount of gas, then the car could not be driving for eternity because it will have already run out of gas an infinite time ago, which is hard, hard for us to wrap our minds around. But this just goes to prove uh, the, the idea that we've already said, which is you cannot have an end with no beginning, logically speaking. So Einstein's theory was showing an ending, which meant that the universe couldn't be eternal. But Einstein didn't like this. He was a materialist. He, he thought that the universe was eternal, and he wanted to hold on to that viewpoint. So what did he do? Well, he postulated that there was an equal but opposite force pushing against gravity, thus keeping everything static. Think, uh, he called this the cosmological constant. And we need to understand this was completely made up. There is no evidence for it. It was, uh, it was created simply because Einstein wanted to avail himself. Uh, he, he wanted to uh, get around the idea that the universe has an end point. He wanted to hold on to the idea that the universe is eternal so that he could remain a materialist. But he would later realize that this cosmological con uh, constant, this this force that he simply made up for convenience was a mistake because eventually he became aware of Hubble's findings. He and Hubble met up. In fact, Einstein went to the Mount Wilson Observatory and he observed the, the evidence himself and he saw that the universe is expanding. And thus he, he later came out and he said, uh, well, let me read to you a quote he said. He, he, he called the cosmological constant the greatest blunder of his life. He had been seeking to preserve a static universe so that he could keep it eternal. But when he finally saw the evidence that it was not, he changed his viewpoint. Einstein honestly looked at the evidence and realized that there has to be some kind of creator. I'm not saying he became a Christian, but he did come to the conclusion that there has to be something beyond the physical universe, which we would call God. Now, these two men and their discoveries lead to a conclusion that the universe had a beginning. It's often called the Big Bang in our uh, in, in science and i think oftentimes when christians hear the term big bang we get afraid we, we we react negatively to it we become afraid because we don't we don't like uh how how scientists have been talking about it over the last few years but what we need to realize is that the big bang actually works in our favor the big bang helps us to prove that the universe is created because everything that has a beginning has to have had an adequate cause. I hope that this helps in the next video, uh, which will be back in our regular classroom environment. We will see some of the responses to this viewpoint and the final nails in the coffin of an eternal universe theory. But I just want to encourage you to realize that anytime a scientist throws out terms like the Big Bang, they might intend for that phrase to, uh, to be an attack toward theistic beliefs. But in actuality, the Big Bang proves that God exists. It proves that the universe had a beginning. We can disagree on, as to how long ago it was and, of course, what caused the Big Bang. But we should not be shy or afraid of the Big Bang Theory, which has been further verified to the point that it is ludicrous to believe anything else. We, we Christians, we believe in a Big Bang. 
We believe God said, let there be light, and in an explosion of light, the universe was created. The evidence points to that, to that very fact.